Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what are my favorite theorems, as usually a very biased point of view, right? My favorite theorems. Um, in particular today, I am kind of want to convince you that the celebrated four color theorem is maybe not all that exciting. Well, that's not quite true. It's still very exciting, um, but there is a related, well, theorem conjecture. It's called Heward's conjecture, uh, which uh, is actually proven. So it comes also under the name ringel young theorem. Um, it took a while until it got proven. Uh, not as bad as for the four color theorem, which took about 120 years. And the proof in the end of the four color theorem is maybe not what you would like it to be because it's usually computer based. So you kind of the idea is um, you boil it down to a huge number of cases you need to check. And the number of cases you need to check is just out of reach for any human being. So you ask a computer for an answer. A priori, that's nothing bad, of course. Um, it's just a little bit unsatisfactory that we understand it not really well enough. And in the end, it's a huge case by case check. Um, with Hebert's conjecture, so this generalization of the four color theorem, it's actually better. And things kind of turn around a little bit. It's kind of fun. Um, so, uh, so if you know the slogan, four colors suffice, then today's slogan is actually, well, maybe not. Maybe one needs more than four colors. But yeah, let's just start directly with the four color theorem itself, which is really, really well known. So if you Google four color theorem, you will find hundreds and hundreds of expository articles, papers, pictures, whatever. Um, the reason is it's very, very easy to explain and it's just super tricky to prove. So the idea is, um, well, either you live in the world of graphs, then this is the right picture, or you live in the world of maps, and then this is the right picture. Um, you can translate from, 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 so let, from graph to maps or from maps to graphs in a very easy way. So let's say you have this uh, graph, and then you just put a vertex per, um, per face, and you just connect neighboring things by a vertex, and you get this associated graph, which is this graph. So from this map, I got by dualizing basically this graph. So whatever kind of problem you prefer, either you like to think about graphs or you like to think about maps. Um, but the statement then is every map is four colorable. So here we see the uh, counties of England. And yeah, as you can see, you only need four colors uh, to color them. And what does this mean? It really means any neighbor, so if you have neighbors, and then they should get different colors. So here's blue up here and it's neighboring this one. So whatever color you would like to give the next one, it, it shouldn't be blue. So for instance, you can make it yellow. And then this green one is neighboring blue and yellow. So you can't color it, well, blue and you can't color it yellow. So let's say you color it green and so on. All right, so neighboring countries get different colors. So there is the famous conjecture, which is very, very old by now. And actually uh, it came up because uh, people try to color really the country, counties of England. Um, and well, then observed, I only need four colors. And by color, I always mean like neighboring uh, countries or neighboring counties, whatever, uh, neighboring regions get different colors. And so the conjecture was then open. It's one of the major conjectures in whatever kind of topological graph theory, something like that. And it remained open for a long, long time, for more than 100 years. And as I just said before, all proofs are kind of a little bit tricky and a little bit unsatisfactory and not, well, I don't know. It, it, it's not optimal. And then it comes, well, that's very nice, uh, everything. Good, and it's also one of the theorems with the most false proofs. So people try to keep on proving this uh, combinatorially. I would rather not do that. So uh, a lot of people fooled themselves by missing crucial cases or whatever crucial steps and arguments. I think giving a combinatorial proof of, of this theorem is probably extremely hard. That's why it was open for such a long time. So it's probably not a good idea to use combinatorial arguments to prove it much more satisfactory would be anyway, like you have some machine that tells you, um, well, like some other big theorem in some, some other fields, it actually tells you that this is true. 
but I think we are pretty far away from that. Anyway, I'm already starting waffling. There is Hevold's conjecture, and it kind of generalizes the four color theorem, but its proof is much, much simpler, which is a bit strange. Um, of course, it's not completely true, right? If you would ju just really strictly generalize um, the four color theorem, but its proof is simpler, then we would have a proof of the four color theorem. So the proof is simpler unless you are in the case of the four color theorem, which is still a, a pretty nice statement. So let's just jump right into it. Um, I will go to Mathematica in a second, but basically what you're asking for is, well, uh, what is a map? A map is actually something you could draw on a sphere, right? So that's a planar map, something you could draw on a sphere. Here's my map. Maybe I shouldn't use yellow. Um, so here's my map. It's somewhere here on the sphere. Well, if you're a topologist, you can easily say, okay, why not? Why would I want to put it on a sphere? Why don't I put it on a torus? So here's my torus. And there's a map on a torus. And here's my torus. So this is a topological picture of a torus. It's just this donut shape. And there's some map on it. And well, as you can see, you need more than four colors. So I said you have blue, uh, well, red, yellow, uh, light blue, purple, orange. Um, so let's have a look at this picture. So this is the same picture. It's a torus. It's a usual construction of a torus from a square. It works as follows. So first you just draw a square and you identify those two sides by gluing uh, the arrows together. So you glue it around like this. You can do this in practice if you want. If you really would like to take a, a sheet of paper, you can actually do it. I rather recommend not to use a square, but like more like a longer rectangle because then things are easier to glue. Uh, anyway, uh, so if you do that, you can imagine it, then you have a cylinder. And now you glue the two opposite ends of the cylinder together and to get this donut shape. In other words, you have an arrow here and an arrow here, and you identify that arrow, those arrows. Um, and that, for example, means if I'm on this surface or on this region, then actually I could go out here and come out here again. So this is the same region. I could go out here and come out here again, in again, and same region, and same down here. So all this yellow stuff is actually the same region. And now you observe the following. So this is a coloring, which actually, or so this is a map on the torus, which actually needs seven colors. So blue, and you realize that blue is surrounded by seven faces. So, uh, well, by six faces. Blue, blue is uh, the first face, let's say. Uh, two, three, four, five, six, seven. But the same is true for all others. So uh, the green one is also surrounded by seven. So uh, one, two, three, four, uh, five. Oh, well, of course you can't see blue. Or let me let me do it red, uh, black. You can't see red on red. Um, so one, two, three, four, five, six. And you think, mm, ah, I'm missing someone. But green comes in here, so this is actually also a neighbor of green. And you can easily check that, uh, well, by just staring at it, that's a proof. Um, you can check that every face here has seven neighbors. So the best you can do is to seven color it. So you need seven colors instead of four. And that was observed by Hewood uh, a, a long time ago, not as long as uh, the original four color theorem or the conjecture but also quite a while ago, 130 years ago, and he realized, oh, on the torus, I actually need seven colors. So uh, the corresponding graph here is also called Hewood graph. As usual, links are in the description, in particular to the Mathematica program I'm, not going, uh, I'm now going to show you. Um, so a demonstration of colorings of the torus. So here's the program, um, link is in the description. And below you see the torus and up here is, so le the left top, um, northwest, you see, well, the square picture of the torus or a zoomed out square picture of, of the torus uh, in, in the northeast. And what you can do is, well, you can play a lot around a little bit with those, with those uh, tilings and you can make more of them if you want, something like that. And you get a bit of bigger picture here and yeah. You could shrink the torus a little bit and you will see that you will always need, yeah, this, this is a good torus, you will always need seven colors no, no matter what you do. 
in this case, because you always have this phenomena that you have, well, seven regions and all of them have six neighbors, right? And that means you just can't, you, you can't go away with fewer than seven colors. So seven instead of four. Mm. Um, I will show you Hewitt's formula in a second, but first of all, let me discuss how you would prove such a, such a theorem, so, such a, let's say, a, a color theorem depending on the genus of the surface. So the sphere, the four color theorem is genus zero. It's just on the sphere, right? You don't have any genus. So genus is just a number of holes. So my little torus here, uh, that's genus one because it's the number of, well, the number of holes here. So there's one hole. This is genus zero because actually secretly this lives on, well, this lives on the planet, right? So it lives on the earth, so it lives on the sphere. So this is genus zero. Um, genus two would be something like that. You could try to draw something on this surface and so on. So you would like to have a color theorem um, depending on G. And he would actually, what they did is um, they proved uh, an upper bound as long as G is not zero. So you have two cases, basically, other surfaces, not the three edge, G is not zero and the three edge is zero. And the upper bound, I will come back to that in a second, um, is given by a nice formula. And he conjectured the same formula for g equals zero, which would be the four color theorem, but he wasn't able to prove it, right? So if you know an upper bound, what do you need to do is you, well, you would like to know a lower bound. And the lower bound just means you construct a graph with a certain property. Uh, for example, here's a graph on a sphere, so g is zero. And this graph obviously needs four colors. Why? Because I have four, four regions and ev every region has three neighbors. Uh, similarly, this one was a, was, a, was, a, was, was a coloring or a, a map with seven regions and every region had six neighbors. So I can't do better with, uh, than using seven colors here and I can't do better than using four colors here. So this is, so find a lower bound for the four color theorem is extremely easy. Here's the picture. <laughs> I mean, here you go, lower bound. You need at least four colors. To find an upper bound for the four color theorem is just ridiculously hard. Uh, funnily, for other surfaces, it's, it's the opposite. To find a lower bound is, is hard and it took a while um, till the mid of the 60s, 1960s, until, until those graphs were found. It's really just constructing, finding a graph, right? But uh, finding an upper bound is extremely easy. So it's already in Hebert's original paper. He argues as follows. Um, so I show you now a proof of the six color theorem. So I need at most six colors. How can I do that? Well, I would use some Euler characteristic argument. I'm talking about planar graphs right now. So on a sphere, I need at most six colors. Um, and I could just prove, well, combinatorially using Euler characteristic that there is a vertex with degree at most five. I can't do better. This is an example, and that's a whole problem for G equals zero for the four color theorem in some sense. So this is a, a example, which is um, kind of the net of the isocahedron where every graph has exactly five neighbors. So the degree of every graph is five, right? If you think in terms of, in terms of, um, uh, in terms of maps, uh, then they're, 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 you can construct a graph where each region or a map where each region has five neighbors. And that's a problem for the following argument. So let's say I, I know this and it's, that's very easy to prove using Euler characteristic um, that you have a vertex of degree at most five. What do you do? Just eliminate that vertex from your graph, just get rid of it. And inductively, you can now say the rest of the graph can be colored using six colors. Okay, but you, that's great, but you took out a vertex which has at most five neighbors. So even if you put that vertex in again, you have one free color. So the whole graph is also six color ripple. And that trick works for any surface bigger than, well, of genus bigger than zero, but not precisely of this stupid thing here. It doesn't work, not just of this, but, but graphs like this, it just doesn't work for G equals zero. To find an upper bound is just ridiculously hard for the four color theorem and for everything else it's easy 
while things turn around for lower bound, well, here you go. That's the lower bound for the four color theorem. While the lower bound for a G not zero is, is really hard to find. Okay, and that's then the formula. So this is the number of colors uh, that you need depending on G. So if you just plot it into whatever, some plot in the numbers for G, you get four, seven, this was the torus, this was the torus. Um, this was our, our four color theorem, of course, of so the sphere, um, and so on. So you get this nice sequence of numbers. And he would conjecture that this upper bound that he found is actually, um, first of all, an upper bound. So he proved it for all of those cases, not for this one. As I said, that's, that's trickier, but now we know it for all of them. So this is really an upper bound. And then, well, Ringel and Young's constructed the corresponding graphs, so uh, of, of, well, the lower bound, right? So this is really now a theorem. So um, C color suffice, where C is this funny number up here. It's kind of fun, it's a, there's a seven from the torus. Um, clearly, if G is zero, then it is just eight over two, so it's four. Um, if G is one, then it's just seven plus seven over two, which is seven and so on. So it's actually a pretty nice and surprisingly easy easy formula, uh, depending on G. And if you're a big fan of Euler characteristic, you can also rewrite it in terms of the Euler characteristic, chi. It looks like this, it's not it's kind of the same formula. And in this case, you can apply it to your favorite surface, even if a non-orientable surface. And you get this funny statement that this formula works for all surfaces, including non-orientable ones, except for the Klein, Klein bottle. So the client model is kind of the party pooper here. It doesn't want to play along with this formula. Uh, let me actually show you, show, to show it to you as well. So um, this is a famous graph. It's called the Franklin graph. Uh, so Franklin, they constructed this counter example to the non-orientable version of, of the Heroot conjecture. And it's a graph you could put on the, uh, so this is, this is the other, uh, so this is a graph. And as you can see, it's non, well, or at least this embedding is non-planar and it is non-planar. And you can put it on, a, but you can put it planar on a Klein bottle. So the, the difference from the, to, uh, from the Klein bottle to the, to the torus, it has exactly the same construction. So if you want, you can, again, uh, try to build it out of paper. It will be a bit tricky, but anyway, um, because this is not embeddable into R3. Uh, anyway, you can try to build it out of paper. It's the same trick. You first form a, a cylinder identifying those edges. And then you want, would like to glue the edges of the cylinder together, but you do it in a twisted way. So identify this arrow with this arrow, right? To just twist everything. Um, if you know what a Möbius strip is, then yeah, it, it's a similar construction to a Möbius strip. And you get this non-orientable Klein bottle. In particular, this green, well, I, I should make it, this green surface here, goes out here and it doesn't come in here, it comes in here, right? So here's green again, it, but it goes out here and comes in here, right? So you go out here again and you come in here. So the green surface is a green surface. And this is a graph that is six colorable, while he would, would conjecture seven. It's kind of one of those funny small number coincidences. And it's the only case, it's the only non-example. Uh, well, not the graph itself, but the client bottle is the only non-example where the formula doesn't hold. So let's have a look at the formula again. So either, either this one or this one more generally holds for any surface uh, except the client bottle. So let's ignore the client bottle. It holds for any surface and it generalizes for color theorem. And it's just much easier to prove than the full color theorem, which is uh, a, a bit surprising. Anyway. Uh, let me wrap up. So we have this Heawood conjecture, which is by now a theorem. Let's me call it the Franklin Ringel Young theorem. Ringel and Young um, proved it by constructing the upper a lower bound. And Franklin disproved it by saying that actually for non-oriental surfaces it doesn't work. And the only one for, for which it doesn't work is the Klein bottle. Anyway, so let me call it the Franklin Ringel Young theorem. And it's this generalization of the four color theorem, which has a funny property that as soon as you leave G equals zero, so G is zero um, for, the, for, the, for, the non, for the orientable case, it's just so much easier to prove. 
because you have this um, Euler characteristic argument, which then works really well, that you have a vertex of a certain degree and you just pull it out from your graph, you color the rest, you put in your vertex again, and there is a free color corresponding to, the, to your guess lower bound. So you can still color it with your guess lower bound. Yeah, so that's why I like this statement so much. And in some sense, it's actually nicer than the four color theorem itself because, well, you, you could draw maps on tori. Why not, right? We all like tori. Um, anyway, uh, I hope you enjoyed the video and I also hope to see you next time.